Welcome back. Um, and to meet the next in our cast of Burgermasters and Great One Years. That's an in joke about Shakespeare, which Tom, I'm afraid you won't get because you arrived after I first made it uh, 24 hours ago. Tom uh, McCarthy is, well, I was going to say a novelist. He writes novels. That's one of the things he certainly does. And we're going to talk about uh, two of his novels. Um, but he is also um, a cultural and literary provo provocateur in many other ways. And you will know by now, some of you will probably be irritated by now, by the fact that I tend to weave a domestic anecdote into most of my, <laughs> into almost everything, really. And Tom has um, had a major influence upon my domestic life already. <laughs> It's true, through, through his book on Tintin, Tintin and the Secret of Literature, because until quite recently, I was in the habit of saying irritably to um, my youngest child, oh, you're not reading Tintin, are you? Again? Read something else. You've read Tintin and the Broken Ear. You've read that already. Um, and then I, I came across... Uh, Tom's book on Tintin and Secret of Literature, in which Hergé meets Derrida, and realised that I was a fool, that actually Hergé was one of the most narratologically complex, it's true, isn't it, narratologically complex and subtle writers that my son was ever going to come across. I'm now thrusting, <laughs> I'm thrusting the broken ear, which I think in Hergé's oeuvre is his sort of King Lear and Pride and Prejudice rolled into one. I thrust it into, back into his hands now, to his perplexity. Um, and uh, Tom's most recent novel is uh, C, which was, uh, as you probably know, shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. Uh, despite his own somewhat satirical uh, uh, comments in the past upon the state of literary fiction in Britain, um, literary fiction has done what literary fiction always does, which is hug those who protest most closest to its bosom. Howard, Howard has already been smooched thoroughly by literary fiction, and, uh, and Tom is being, has been courted by it too. But we're going to start with um, Shakespeare, as usual. And um, I don't know if you want to say anything about your reading before you do it, Tom. It's one we've... We've already had a bit of this, but it bears repetition, and also Tom, and I think, wants to talk a bit about repetition, so perhaps appropriate. So do you want to say what you're doing? Oh, OK, I'm just going to read um, a very short passage, Caliban's speech. Do you want to stand up to do it all? It's so short. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, Caliban's speech from The Tempest. Apparently, yeah, I, I love repetition. Shakespeare is all about repetition. Um, Caliban is describing... For me, he, he, he may as well be describing radio. I mean, indeed, the, the, the person who's generating the, the sounds he talks about is um, Ariel. Um, so Ariel is running around. So we can make links to Hamlet here, kind of ventriloquizing, um, putting snatches of conversation and innuendo where they don't belong. And Trinculo and Stefano are totally kind of freaked out by this. And Caliban tries to reassure them, and he says, be not afeard, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep will make me sleep again. And then, in dreaming, the clouds methought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me, that when I waked, I cried to dream again. That's... That's what he says. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you choose that? Well, it's just, I mean, it's a beautiful passage, but, but I think it kind of um, picks up on something that for me is essential about, about literature in its entirety, which is, I mean, you know, literature more or less begins with an account of a signal being transmitted across space. I mean, 458 BC, the opening scene of Agamemnon, the first play, in Aeschylus's Oresteia, the first thing that happens is a watchman comes on a roof and sees a signal 
It's the, it's the signal coming from afar that says Troy has fallen. And he wakes everyone up, and um, Clytemnestra, Agamemnon's wife, comes out and gives a very long speech saying, yeah, Troy has fallen, yeah, yeah, we, we know that. But, but, but she spends the next kind of two, three pages naming every single one of the transmission points. So the signal, Troy is too far away for a light beacon to be seen at, by Argos. It has to be transmitted by a chain of beacons. There's about nine or ten of them. And she names every single one. She says, you know, it went from Mount whatever to the Aegean Sea to the Straits of Messina. And she's basically naming the nodes and relays of a transmission chain. And I've looked into this. These weren't just little kind of bonfires on a hilltop. They were sophisticated machines with movable parts and attendant encryption systems. And I think what the point that is being made right at the off, before Agamemnon comes home and gets killed and before there's all these debates about justice and retribution, before any of these dramas and family and political and private dramas can take place, first, there is a signal. We are in the regime of the signal. Everything is contingent on that. So, the, but the Caliban... The Caliban one is strange too, isn't it? Because as you, were, as you were describing the context of the dramatic context in the play, he's saying it to, to Stefano and Trinculo, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. And they are in the process of planning a murder. Yeah, they I want think. to kill yes. Prospero and they're totally drunk. And, yes. Yeah. And, and so, and it's funny, isn't it? Because as you said, you got to the end of it and you said it's beautiful and it is. Um, and I was thinking as you, as you read it, it, was it not the piece chosen for Kenneth Branagh in a top hat to orate at the opening of the Olympic Games oh, in London? I yeah, believe well, it was. <laughs> I believe yeah. it was. Um, the aisle of, is full of noises. And, oh, yeah, I remember that. And, yeah, and, and, yeah. and somehow yeah. it was a patriotic thing. The yeah. aisle was then Britain. This is the thing. I mean, you know, and Shakespeare was full of Shakespeare noises. Yeah, and, yeah. no, this is... I mean, uh, you know, I, I was looking during the last dialogue at you know, Shakespeare, our contemporary, and, and I, I agree. I mean, I think Shakespeare is utterly contemporary. For example, if we want to understand what's going on with the NSA in Snowden, we should read Hamlet. It's all in Hamlet. Surveillance, no, absolutely, straight up. Surveillance, did, you know, data... Um, data surveillance is about a police state. It's about an information police state. Um, but... For Shakespeare to, to do anything meaningful and productive in the here and now, it needs to be rescued from the culture industry. It needs to be rescued from this kind of banal, jingoistic, sentimental kind of bullshit mechanism that it's caught up in. And this is a perfect example. You know, you get sports readers reading the bit about this scepter dial, cutting it before, you know, it's leased out to foreign, <laughs> you know, over pictures of the rugby team. I mean, this is Shakespeare is continually kind of appropriated or, or appropriated to make kind of snippets of self-help nuggets of wisdom. And, and, you know, Shakespeare is a genuinely radical writer. He's a subversive writer. I mean, Hamlet is utterly obscene and utterly subversive, um, not just of, of political orders, but of, of certain kind of types of you know, kind of humanist models of subjectivity, of, of identity and, and Shakespeare can only kind of, I think, blossom as a, as a genuine contemporary writer once he's, yeah, read carefully outside of um, Not by Kenneth Branagh. <laughs> but Kenneth Branagh, <laughs> can I be, I'll be devil's advocate a bit? I mean, Kenneth Branagh read it quite well. He, I mean, oh, he spoke sure, it yeah. quite no, well. I'm sure he has, has good And indeed, you talk about Hamlet and as being uh, uh, a kind of play about surveillance and state control and it is this you know Denmark is a prison um I've seen Kenneth Branagh not on film but on, I saw him on film as well which wasn't so good but I saw him playing Hamlet as a young man and uh I suppose in a way that was part of the culture industry wasn't it my going to the theatre to see him Judy Dench as Gertrude I seem to remember and they played it the production was done in a in a manner not I mean, quite subconsonant with what you're saying. I mean, there was a great emphasis. Polonius was not an idiot. He was sinister. Yeah, yeah. Um, and played by the late, great Richard Briers. 
And, um, and I thought, oh, I thought this, man was, this was a situation comedy man. He's a safe, nice actor. I don't know if Cinematic he's known in Germany, but he played in a, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a sort of very popular British, comfortable British sitcom about the people doing organic farming in the suburbs. But there he was, he was a really sinister Polonius. Um, and, I mean, it isn't... That was part of the culture. Don't we need the culture industry as well to keep people interested in Shakespeare? I mean, I don't know, what, what isn't the culture industry? I mean, everything is the culture industry. I mean, <laughs> maybe I'm using it in a, in a too narrow sense. I saw a brilliant production of Hamlet. The only production of Hamlet that hasn't made me just want to, I, I hate seeing theatre, I'm really sorry, I just hate, <laughs> you know, Shakespeare is, is a writer, it's about, it's about the possibility of language for me, and, and whenever I see theatre, this just reduces this to, to someone shouting, you know, and the same people say, oh, to understand Joyce, you need to hear it, and this, I mean, this is absolutely wrong, it's about, it's about, it's like Malamé, it's about what, what words are doing on a page, and the way they're leaking, and connoting and anyhow I saw this really good production quite recently by the Worcester group in New York where they'd um they'd found a 1963 film that was made from a, a Richard Burton stage production and it was filmed from 10 different cameras and then shown in cinemas all across America in a kind of four-hour version and they said okay we're going to reverse this and take this back to theatre so they had monitors all around the theatre and the actors all had earpieces and they quite literally re-enacted what they were seeing on the screens, and they'd edit it down to about two hours. So there were loads of jump cuts, so the actors just jumped. And, and, and you know, it sounds like a gimmick, but this is absolutely what Hamlet's about. I mean, repetition, reenactment, mediation, an awareness of all the codes. I mean, Hamlet can't do anything coherently precisely because he knows the way the spectacle works. You know, he knows what codes are at play, and these codes are continually kind of running up against each other and interrupting and jarring and breaking apart. And he kind of goes into this vortex of uh, this infinite regress of kind of mediation and repetition. And I felt that piece really kind of got it. But I can't, you know, but it, it did it by, by preventing any of the actors kind of embodying some personality or whatever. It was about a process of interruption. Well, that, is, it's interesting you say the thing about your, um, your uh, uh, dislike of, of lots of, actual productions of it because actually Howard Jacobson a couple of days ago said said perhaps um, uh, uh, incautiously that he preferred he liked reading Shakespeare oh. rather than seeing it I'm, and, I'm with and, you, and he's yeah <laughs> and um, yeah and uh, Dr. Johnson said that too better read than seen and he hardly ever cool. went to the theatre yeah or, although he did say one of the reasons he didn't was because he was distracted by the actress's bubbies he said. <laughs> um, he did, he did. He said that was so he couldn't concentrate on the text. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> uh, when I'm, when I'm minister, after, after come the revolution, when I am minister of culture, all theatres, the first decree will be that all theatres become car parks, because yes. car parks are genuinely, I mean, this is something Ballard writes about so brilliantly, <laughs> car parks are genuinely fascinating spaces full of narrative possibility, event possibility, <laughs> geometry, Theatre has, uh, there's no reason why it couldn't be. I mean, but, you know, I mean, theatre for the Greeks was, was active, it wasn't entertainment, it wasn't, it was actively putting meaning in the world in the form of a question. It was a genuine, you know, it was like watching a battle. Going but to isn't, the isn't the reason, you know, isn't, it, isn't there a very simple lost. reason why this thought that Shakespeare in particular is sort of better read than watched, that, that, that there's a particular and, and kind of, quite pragmatic reason in a way, that when, when anybody reads Shakespeare, when you read Shakespeare, um, there are different possibilities available in the reading. And in some ways you can sort of hold those. This is something we've kind of come across in earlier discussions in this seminar actually. And you can sort of hold those possibilities in your head. Or you can make it into the Shakespeare that you want it to be. When somebody puts a production on, they have to make choices. Yeah. And they have to they have to tell actors or advise actors how to do things, and so they've made an interpretation. And unless, like the New York one you you just describe, it it accords with what we want, um, we're quite likely to think, no, no, that's not it. That's not it at all. 
Yeah, but I mean, I don't know, I don't want to get into an argument about it, but the, all, all the English theatre productions, I say, it's the same production. It's about an affirmation of a kind of subjective authenticity and, you know, the depths of my feeling. And, and you know, Shakespeare's not really about this. It's about processes. It's about, you know, a, a modernity in the process of, of configuring itself and, and along these axes of law, you know, capital, um, desire, violence, power, and, and, and so on. These are, these are the real kind of protagonists in Shakespeare's work. I mean, that's why, you know, The Merchant of Venice is so, fa I'm going to talk about that this afternoon, but it's so fascinating. You see all these people are like, you know, the gnats in cobwebs that Bassanio talks about. They're, they're, they're kind of small players in this giant web of, um, of modernity, you know, which is a, a contestable and difficult thing. I mean, that, that's, that's what needs to be it seems to me this is what Shakespeare's grappling with, and this is what's happening in Shakespeare. And, and when this gets done in the theatre, it becomes about individuals on a stage. And do you think, I mean, it's, it's funny you say that, because also, I suppose, the sort of, um, the, uh, the Shakespeare academic would say, um, but that goes right against, that's an appropriation of Shakespeare, which goes right against sort of, his own, if you like, career path, because, of course, he notoriously seems to be pretty careless about putting it on the page and pretty careless about the reader and, indeed, didn't seem, unlike his contemporary, Ben Jonson, who took great care in getting his plays published and printed with a sort of the works of Ben Jonson, and he clearly thought the reader, like you, was much more important than the theatre-goer. But Shakespeare it seems to be in the opposite, and it's, it's an incredible fluke, isn't it? We've got half the plays. I mean, they were yeah. swimming around bits of paper for seven years after his death, unpublished. Anything could have happened to them. Shakespeare knows someone's going to take care of the archive. I mean, he knows how good he is. And no, his, his work, you know, um, it's in the sonnets, you know, and uh, that in black ink, my love shall still shine bright, nor, knocks, nor rocks, nor brass, nor stone or endless sea, I mean, this poem's going to live forever. It's going to be here till the end of time, when all the rest has crumbled away. This, he knows it's going to last. But isn't that, aren't he, isn't he, doesn't he think perhaps differently about poems? From no, because, I mean, if you, even if you look at Hamlet, I mean, Hamlet is a writer. This is the first thing that Hamlet does is get out his tablet. Yeah. First thing he does, my tablet, is me, I set it down. The ghost says, kill your uncle. He goes... I'm going to write this down, you know, one may smile and smile. And then he spends the whole time, words, 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 walking around, reading, writing. He rewrites the murder of Gonzago and reenacts it in front of the court, reenacts his uncle's death. It's a totally, even all of his, all of Shakespeare's metaphors for, um, as with Freud, actually, for, for, for the memory and consciousness and even agency are, are about technologies of writing and of, and of archiving and recording. I think he's totally, you know, he, he sees his own activity in, in kind of scriptural, you know, ways. And the rest, I mean, of course, you know, the theatre is his outlet and he's, I mean, he's, he's brilliant at using available means. He's a kind of hacker, if you like. So, you know, the theatre says to him, look, we want a good old comic piece of, you know, Jew-baiting comedy. You know, will you write something, rework this old story? And he, so he, he does The Merchant of Venice, which seems to be that. And, and even as it delivers this, flips 180 degrees into this devastating study of Christian anti-Semitism. And then kind of flips back again, but the damage has been done. I mean, he's a great Trojan horse, you know kind of writer, or, or with Hamlet, you know, OK, we want a revenge tragedy, so he writes one in which the guy doesn't do the only thing he's meant to do. I mean, it's, it's brilliant. It's, I think, I, it's interesting you say Hamlet is a writer and a, a hacker, because, of course, the, he does actually do a bit of hacking, doesn't he? The most powerful bit of writing oh, the that switch he does letter, is the, the letter that he writes. We Absolutely. Really never see he switches the, the letter. letter of, Hamlet about, is a play yeah. about... I mean, you could provocatively say that Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet are plays about the postal system. I mean, the vital <laughs> plot... This is something that Baz Luhrmann picks up on really well in his, his wonderful kind of MTV generation version of Romeo and Juliet, the movie. Um, when he has the, the vital letter delivered to Romeo by FedEx, and they go, you know, we, we called out, but you were... I mean, this is... I yeah. mean, in the play, it's because of disease, and the letter can't be delivered, but it's all about delivery of, of letters, purveying of information, which comes back to Caliban's speech as well, interception of information. In that sense, 
you know, Shakespeare's work kind of sets up the possibility of, of, of you know, Richardson and Clarissa and the whole 18th century epistolary novel, not to mention something like Thomas Pynchon's Crying of Lot 49, you know, more recently. I mean, so, yeah, Hamlet, Hamlet is a writer, Hamlet is a hacker. I've always thought the most extraordinary thing in a way in Hamlet is the fact that we and Hamlet uh, can rely on the fact that when this letter arrives at the English court and it says, kill the people who bring the letter, they go, right, OK. That's right, yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. It's brilliant. They're carrying their own death warrant. Every, every, you know, they're carrying their own. Literature has always been about indirection, encryption, encrypted, we could say transmission or encrypted... Uh, indirect speech, and Shakespeare is a perfect example of that. I mean, Shakespeare's plays had to go to the stationer's office. Anything published then had to be vetted by the stationer's office that was basically the censorship office. So, I mean, the, the writers are using enormous amounts of um, indirection and encoding, and uh, I mean, even to address political um, concerns of, of the day. I mean, as, as Carl Schmitt, the, the great German uh, the great Nazi jurist um, uh, points out, you know, Hamlet, that, that it, he claims that everyone would have kind of known but not been able to say that this is kind of about James I and his murder. So the whole play is the kind of death of Gonzago. But, sorry, I'm, I'm deviating a bit. The point is, literature has always been about indirect um, speech. <laughs>